standards hike looks like a big green tax on consumers and unprofitable for car makers. Here now to debate is Myron Ebel, Energy and Global Warming Policy Director of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and Roland Wong, the Transportation Director at the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Myron, let me start with you. I mean, on the surface, it looks like very expensive cars. Consumers may not like the price hikes. They'd rather have price cuts, and they're not very safe. Uh, that's right, Larry. And of course, the way the economy is going, maybe we don't have too many worries. Maybe not that many people will be able to afford new cars. And the cars that they're going to be uh, given a choice now, a very limited choice, are going to be smaller, have uh, less performance, and they're going to be less safe than the current mix of, of cars that are on the market. And Roland Wong, I, so far, no one's shown me how these can be profitably produced because thus far in the history of the car makers, one of the reasons they're down and out is they've been forced by prior cafe fuel standards and other restraints to build a lot smaller cars than they want. They got to build them here under union wages and rules and regulations, and therefore they're losing their shirt. The big dough is in the SUVs, which may be out to dinner. So, Roland, how do you respond to that? Consumers may not buy them, and the manufacturers can make them profitably. Well, the fact of the matter is that this sta these standards will be good for consumers, good for the environment, and good for our energy security. This program will deliver technologies that have a three-year payback time. It will pay for itself in three years' time. That's a 33% return rate of return on the fuel-saving technologies. It will save the U.S. 1.9 billion barrels of oil. This is a great program for consumers. It's a great program for national security. Uh, the fact of the matter also is that Detroit has been far too dependent on gas, trying to sell gas guzzling vehicles. That's pickups and large SUVs. The marketplace has changed. The market is for fuel efficient What's vehicles. What's the evidence, Roland? Let me just ask you two follow-ups, and sure. I'll get Myron to, 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 to respond. First of all, a three-year payoff, 33 and a third percent. Where's that number come from? That came from the president's mouth uh, uh, himself. I was, so where's uh, that number come from? That comes from a joint analysis by the Department of Transportation and by the Environmental Protection Agency. And I would say that number um, is a very conservative number uh, based upon my own research on how regulation stimulates innovation. We do know that putting performance-based standards, allowing industry to meet standards, creates innovation. We've seen it time and time again with green technologies and other areas, whether it's airbags or well, seat belts, air pollution control devices, um, the, the, the new standards, innovation drive down will drive down costs. Myron, I always thought free markets and free enterprise stimulated Schumpeterian innovation and entrepreneurship. And so I'm a little cons I'm not sure I understand the point about regulation stimulates that. Sounds a lot like government controls. But let me go to the first point. You can answer both of these. This 33 and a third percent rate of return that's coming from uh, the White House. Where's that? What, what do you think of that number? Uh, not much. You know, I think you got it exactly exactly right, Larry. Free markets and consumers making choices are what stimulate innovation and technological progress. The fact is that the government has been stifling uh, innovation through all of these regulations. Uh, we would be far ahead with renewable energy if we didn't have all these mandates and subsidies. These, these people become corporate welfare dependents. Now we've got General Motors and Chrysler, which are essentially government managed. If you think that they've uh, been poorly managed under private ownership, wait till you know President Obama and NRDC start making the decisions for what kind of cars you're going to be allowed to drive. Well, Roland, nobody's explained to me how to make money on these cars. That's the thing. And I want to ask you, in your view, what you know, will GM, for example, be able to produce the parts and the major parts of the chassis overseas in uh, cheaper labor places like China, for example. As I understand it, the UAW, which has the full backing of the White House in most things, will not let them do that. If they have to make them at home, they can't do it, whereas their competitors, Honda and Nissan and the rest, can do it overseas more cheaply. Well, well first of all, I'd like to try to respond to this question about government standards, innovation, and competitiveness. Um, what I just heard was completely counterfactual to what we've observed in the marketplace today, which is that over the last 20 years, the government has failed, has failed Detroit in, in, in setting higher standards for fuel economy and air pollution, uh, in this case, global warming pollution. They have failed the industry. Unlike in other countries who have much higher fuel economy, they, and they're delivering vehicles today to the U.S. marketplace that are much more competitive than the 
Detroit products. But nobody's the problem, buying them, Roland. Nobody's so this buying is, these cars. Well, I mean, that's the, 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 that's the, the, the trouble I have with this analysis. Is can, can I can I respond here? Look, uh, Toyota's pickups get poorer mileage than General Motors and Ford's pickups. The fact is that they sell a lot of very small cars, which they produce at, as you say, Larry, at lower wages, lower production costs overseas. They can't compete in the big car market. Their cars are actually less fuel efficient than the American. I makers. mean, Roland, the the foreign, the foreign transplants, for example, can operate what Holman Jenkins of the Wall Street Journal calls the two-fleet rule. They can do this stuff overseas and then import them back to the U.S. But our car makers in Detroit can't do that. And because of the higher expense of these green cars, they've been sunk for years. We helped bankrupt them, did we not? Detroit manufacturers and American workers and American engineers are second to none in the world. I believe they can compete. If you're looking at the products that General Motors is starting to deliver, what Ford are starting to deliver to the marketplace, you are seeing a dramatically different industry. And that is all that's driven by market competitiveness issues. It's also driven by the expectation of new standards. American workers and American auto workers and American companies, American engineers, they can compete with 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 any auto uh, company well, in the world. Well, I think you're right, Roland. I do think you're right, by the way. I just think they've been playing with at least one hand tied behind their back, because I don't agree with you about the benefits of the regulations, but I could be wrong. I appreciate you coming on the program. Myron Ebel, it's good to see you Thank again. You. Thank you so much. Coming up, my big headlines of the day. And then later on, California voters are going to send the governor running for Washington, and we'll have a bull bear market you won't want to miss. Why is the governor in D.C.? rather than California.